Uh, sure. Thanks, Rikas. Thanks. This was really nice. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to this session. Although Vikas has given my uh, uh, introduction in terms of what I currently do, but I think in terms of what we are trying to discuss today, it is very important for you to know what I did in the past. So uh, not just that I'm a principal consultant at ATCS, which is a Salesforce partner, and I'm based out in Jaipur, uh, my 14 years of prior experience has been around marketing and consulting and marketing strategy, and which is why marketing is something that is core to me. And um, uh, if, if I look at the past uh, videos as Vikas and Anil have done, uh, most of them revolved around technology. Uh, we talk less about marketing and more about technology, and which is why I think it is most important for us to understand what the marketer thinks and what the marketer speaks, and which is why marketing in MarTech today. Uh, let me share my screen so that we can begin with our session. One second. Sure, Divya. Yep. Is my screen uh, visible, Vikas? Uh, yep, it is now. Okay. You can go in the presenter mode. Yep, I think I'm unable to do that. Ah, yeah, now it's up. Yep, perfect. Okay. So oh, rather before coming to my joke, I would rather say that uh, on a lighter note, I am also a fan of Dilbert uh, comic strips. And uh, why I say so is, and why I've selected this topic for today is for primarily two reasons. Until about two to three years back, I was a hardcore consultant and marketer, but uh, I switched to tech, similar to Vikas, who comes from a mechanical field, I feel. And I moved to the MarTech space, and my company was a Salesforce partner. Two things that I noticed uh, was a gap in the MarTech space or the Salesforce marketing automation space was one, our audience mostly is a marketer, and we don't speak the marketer's language. Second is nicely communicated through this joke, which says jargon poisoning. What the jargon poisoning mean is that we use a lot of Salesforce related terminologies in front of the marketer and a lot of times they don't understand what it means. So we might be talking about data extensions or cloud pages or AMP scripts or JavaScripts and API connectors, but if they don't understand it, there is no point that we are taking any of this relationship forward. And which is why it is very important that we understand how the marketer speaks and what does he speak. And when I say we have to understand, I am talking about all the consultants in the Salesforce sphere. I'm talking about all the technical people here, coders here, and I'm also talking about project managers. This brings me towards the agenda or rather the objective of uh, what we want to achieve here. Before moving on to the session's objective, I would like to say the core role of a Salesforce implementation partner in terms of with the marketer or the brand or the tech company that we're working with is primarily to address the marketing automation challenges, which begins with identifying these business challenges, which pertains to, of course, digital marketing. We do not talk about offline marketing here. So the agenda of today's session is that for all us stakeholders, Salesforce stakeholders to understand these basics of digital marketing. And so we understand what the marketer speaks, we understand what the marketer's lingo and the language is, and then furthermore, we speak that same language. So the client understands what we are trying to say through a Salesforce solution. For us today, my primary agenda would be to brief you all what a marketer is. This might sound very simple to most of you. Most of you might already be know, knowing what this is, but this lays ground to what I'm trying to say, what the relationship between this marketer or the brand or the client is with us. So I will start with, uh, giving you a brief ar ar around what the marketer looks like and what is his role. Uh, what is the relationship between this marketer and the tech partner that is most likely us, if we all are from an implementation partner. Thirdly, the terminology that a digital marketer will use in front of you and you should know so that you can relate it with what that terminology is in a Salesforce solution. Fourth, I will take you a little bit deeper on what the digital funnels are, consumer journeys are, and what is the importance of actually knowing these terminologies. Fifth, a little bit around industry knowledge and some best practices. And lastly, I will take you through a sample use case on how do we actually enable the marketer to identify what the business challenge is. So 
let me begin with telling you who the marketer is very simply a marketer is anybody in a company who is trying to execute a marketing strategy of a product the marketing strategy could evolve offline and online means and for people who do not know offline could be anything which is not digital in nature uh, a billboard or a print ad and a digital strategy is anything online it could be a tv ad and uh, an email strategy a social strategy etc so a marketer's role is that to use organic and paid sources to execute the marketing plan of a product or a service a digital marketer role is not only limited to just offline and online the, as i said it encompasses all channels of marketing however as vikas rightly said the world is moving towards digital more especially because of the impact of covid the role of a digital marketer is more so important in these days as compared to uh, a marketer who was looking at offline channels a very important thing to know here is that out of all the people who work on a salesforce solution whether it is salesforce or uh, us as implementation partners or the brand it is only the brand's marketer who has the most clear picture of its product and the consumer journey of the product and you will know through further slides why i am talking about this point and why the marketer is only the person who is clear about this picture now briefly taking you through about the roles of this marketing uh, of this marketer in the company so that we know uh, what are the jobs that they do uh, knowing this helps us where all are his positions where we can support through a solution so at a high level his key roles are to do market research and consumer service to understand their customer it helps them define a customer persona or design a customer journey and i will be taking you in detail through these terminologies of what i mean advertising or promotion strategy content ideation or even content creation at certain points monitoring and tracking these campaigns they could be organic or paid both and then finally looking at the value proposition of what their budgets were and what roi did they drive from that yes uh moving forward how does a tech partner enable a marketer in this entire salesforce ecosystem as you all must be knowing we have three core elements of a salesforce ecosystem the salesforce solution itself partners like us and the customer what does what is the role of a partner here a partner plays a dual role how one between salesforce and the partner a partner tries to understand and decode a salesforce solution and then associates it with a business problem it could be across any client across any geography from a customer perspective a partner educates itself enough to understand what is the basic marketer's business so that they can identify the challenge and suggest the right sales for solution and solve the problem in short a marketer and a consultant to get and a consultant could be a marketer as well and from the tech side uh, from the implementation partner side as well both of them together actually find the answers to what why when and where while the tech teams and the tech leads actually find the answer to how are they going to solve this problem i will take you through a diagram that most of you all must have seen in your companies while you share scoping of work and how much time will you take in the entire implementation journey uh this could have your own formats you could be sharing gantt charts or ppts or such kind of charts when you scope out how much time will you take to uh, start the implementation and complete the implementation of an automation solution for a client usually there are four to five phases to this you have a discovery phase where you try and understand what the problem is a consulting advisory phase that goes on throughout the journey of the implementation because there could be phases in which you implement something then a configuration and a setup phase then testing and then training if required uh, why it is important that what these phases mean to us and to the marketer is that if you look at the discovery and the consulting advisory phase of this entire journey this caters to an unknown problem most of the time we do not know what the client's challenge is i mean at a high level we might know a client might not tell us 100 things about the problem or everything about their business but they will give us glimpses of what that means 
and which is why this entire area becomes a juggle into what we can understand from the internet about their business and what we can understand from what the client tells us. Somewhere there always remains a gray area of what we don't know. However, on the other side, when it comes to configuration or setting up of journeys and probably testing, these are known solutions. These are done by most of you guys present right now on this call who are certified, who know how to solve this problem. So this area is somewhere, somewhere easier in that form that you exactly know what the solution is. It's only when a client comes out with a problem that is uh, not that easy to solve is when you will try and find out a new solution or a workaround around how to solve it. And which is where this unknown problem area becomes most important to, again, all three people involved in this implementation journey, whether a consultant, a project manager, or a tech person, which is why this particular session I feel is important to all of you. Again, moving forward uh, with the joke that you might be able to relate to when I talk about jargon. And why am I so uh, uh, stuck with this world called jargon? I come from a marketing site and I've moved into tech. And when I see people talking about terminologies that I don't understand, I know that my client is also not able, not will not be able to understand what we are talking about. If this is our strategy and we want to look smarter in front of the client, then probably this is a failure ground for all of us. We need to be speaking what the marketer understands. So we need to step out from our comfort zones as tech people and start speak the marketer language because the marketer has already stepped out of his comfort zone and is trying to understand technology. So there are certain do's and don'ts related to what we should be doing. Simple do's are we should keep, we should give ample time to the brand or the marketer or the team, which could also be a tech team to explain what their business is. The more they are able to speak about it, the more we understand what they are into and how their business operates. Second, as a partner, we should be asking relevant questions, which will help solve the marketer's problem. And why I uh, stress upon relevant questions is, it brings me to the first quiz that uh, uh, Anil posted on, on Jaipur says first. What should be your first question? Some of the answers also included, we should not be asking any questions. No, please. The more questions you have, the more you go nearer to the problem. You should not lose this time in, of discovery or speaking to the client, which, which falls somewhere before configuration and setting up, to not ask any question. You should definitely be asking questions. What you should not be asking is very intrusive questions. That, that brings me to the don'ts of what, should not, what should, you should not be doing. Intrusive questions should not be asked. Very high level questions should not be asked. Some of you also answered by saying that we should be asking about their sales strategy. Most of the time, because we're not supporting in sales, we're supporting in marketing, it is none of our business somewhere at times to know what their sales strategy is. At least not at an open-ended level where we want to know how, how do they sell their product. This will not solve a problem for them. We are, we are here, at least in the marketing cloud space, trying to solve a marketing problem right now. So it's relevant more if we ask what problem in their marketing business are we trying to solve and be specific about what we want to ask them. Again, uh, any questions that do not, uh, the answers to these questions, if they do not help us solve a problem, it is suggested that we should avoid asking those questions. And third, my favorite, we should not use tech jargons in front of these clients. It intimidates them and somewhere, it could have two uh, uh, outcomes. Either the client will not ask what this means and just keep quiet. That could be loss, for business, loss of business for us. Or he asks, but it makes him feel um, that maybe he's asking too basic a query and I should have known this already. So our job is to make the client feel special rather than feel intimidated by the terminologies that we use. This takes me to understanding of certain terminologies that a digital marketer use, uh, uses. And just for the interest of time, I will not deep dive into each terminology, but I will give you a hint R, and you can go, uh, rather, I would advise that you go use these terms and study a little bit more about these, what they mean. Because half the time when you'll be speaking to these teams and your clients and the marketer, they will be using these terms in front of you. 
I've broken this down into two parts. Certain terms relate to the databases and the others would relate to journey. First related to the database and data extensions and whatnot that we call them in Salesforce. These terminologies that a marketer is more familiar with would sound like a business model, a target audience, customer segment, database, lookalikes or similar audiences, leads or retargeting. If, if I have to quickly touch upon what these terms mean, a business model is what the product is, how do they sell, how they reach out to the customer. We should know, uh, is it a B2B business, a B2C business, a mix of both or some other type of business. We should know what is the target audience. When the client says target audience, it means that specific group of people which is most likely to want their product or service. When a client speaks lookalike and similar audience, and most of us might already be aware of this terminology because Ad Studio uses a similar term terminology. But then from a marketer perspective, we should be aware that if he is not using the word lookalike and using the word similar, it means the same, just the platforms are two different platforms. We should know that in a lookalike audience, what can be tracked and what cannot be tracked before the client says, why do I do not see the email IDs of these customers? When it comes to retargeting, and this is one of the favorite words of all the marketers, because this is the part where a marketer is able to convert, convert maximum of its leads into its prospect. And this retargeting is basically a tactic to advertise to lapsed users. What could be these lapsed users? These users could be anybody who came to the website, went onto the payment page, filled half the details, but left, added something to the cart, but did not actually end up buying it. So retargeting to these uh, lapsed customers is known as remarketing or retargeting. I spoke about leads in this retargeting. Lead is very important. Lead is because we all exist here in the Salesforce ecosystem because we want to reduce our reach time to this lead. We want to personalize that experience and we want that this lead should convert into our actual customer. So lead is just a person who has shown interest in the brand and the product. And this is our potential customer. The primary goal of any company is to actually generate as many leads as possible. And SFMC actually expedites the process because you can send volumes, you can send it at time, you can send it at the right time and you can personalize and everything. And ultimately, customer segmentation, data and databases. So rather than using terminologies as data extension, and you should be using once the customer is also comfortable understanding that when you're talking about a segment, then it is probably customer, uh, then it is probably uh, data extension. So a custom segment is nothing but segmenting of these groups into similar groups or with similarities. Before you digest all of this, I will make this slide a little easier for all of you. And this is the most important in terms of the, in terms of the concepts that you should be knowing. These are concepts related to journeys that you are building in Journey Builder probably. You should know what a digital funnel is. You should also know what a consumer journey is. An omni-channel strategy is also a lot of times that a marketer uses and he nurtures the lead through a digital funnel. I'm assuming that card abandonment and landing pages is common terms for you, especially the ones who are already implementing one journey or the other. Card abandonment is one of the favorite topics of most of the marketers and a problem they want to solve. Uh, I'll briefly touch upon what a digital funnel is and what a consumer journey is, and then I'll move on to what their importance is. So a digital, digital marketing funnel is nothing but a process of how a prospect becomes your customer. It is a buyer's journey which starts from making the customer aware about the product, finally raising his desires or interest about that product, and then finally converting it. When we move on to consumer journey, a consumer journey is nothing but the entire experience that a customer encompasses when he communicates with the brands. So it, it, con it consists of its entire journey from when he first starts to interact with the brand, whether through a Google search, whether through its website, whether through an email that he receives from a brand or an SMS. And it goes beyond till he gets converted. And even in, most, in moments, this goes beyond uh, even purchase. If you look at this diagram of how this funnel looks like, it starts with awareness, it moves on to consideration, then a lead converts, 
once it converts, it moves to the loyalty and, and advocacy phase. So when once I'm converted as a lead, I'm some person who could be given referral bonuses in terms of if I spread the message of the bank or if I add more users to the bank. What is important for us is to understand that most of the challenges of our marketers and the clients somewhere revolve around converting these aware uh, prospects into final customers. And which is why most of the consumers journeys that we create in Journey Builder revolve around consideration and conversion phase, which is also called lead nurturing for us. So when a client says, I would like to do five emails over a period of one month, then this means that customers were not dropping from the funnel from awareness to conversion. They want to nurture these raised, uh, leads through these emails or SMSs or Facebook ads. The importance of doing this is three pro. One, you get to segment the data. Second, you get to generate more targeted leads. And third, the nurture experience of the customer makes the entire sales process seems easier. Coming up to the next topic, industry knowledge and best practice. And most of you, especially if you all are, or majority of you all are from a technical side, you might feel, why do you even want to have industry knowledge? The client could be from any industry. All I need to do is, I know Salesforce, I know how to solve this problem. Somebody will tell me what the problem is and I will go ahead and solve it. I would say no. If this is what most of you all think, then this should not be the case. We all should be preparing for these discovery sessions and knowing our client better. How we can do that is, and why first of all we should do this is, our clients could be from varied sectors and varied geographies. They could all have different nuances and business models. What we need to do is that we need to, before meeting the client, at least know what their business is, what their product is, and what do they do in the market. Three primary things that we should be knowing is, the business understanding from whatever is available on the website and on the internet. Where are they based at? Are they a new business or a established entity? What is their social media presence and how strong it is? So they could be present at all portals, but if they have 10, 20 followers, then it means the presence is strong. If this could be their pain point, knowing about the products and services of the brand, how it is laid out in the website. What this helps us in, that if the website is laid out very nicely, it gives us a glimpse beforehand if the client has clarity around what their consumer journey is like. Most of the time, a nicely developed website basically shows us and makes our life easier in terms of knowing that, okay, this is the marketer. They want the consumer to reach from this point to this point, awareness to conversion on their website in this sequence and how easy and seamless it is. Shows us how, wh what clarity does the marketer have. Uh, I, I'll give you a, a, a funny uh, uh, incident that happened and which is maybe uh, how you will be able to relate why this is important that you study this first. And I will not take the client's name, but uh, uh, there was a client uh, uh, whose name actually included a term which related to healthcare or hospital. And uh, when that uh, client got onboarded and we went to the first meeting, uh, the brand started speaking about themselves and everybody was shocked because most of us came prepared in that meeting thinking uh, they are into the healthcare space. We have worked with a lot of healthcare clients. It will be a very easy game for all of us. We understand their business. We need not go and study about them. The client, although their name contained something like a healthcare terminology, turned out to be a real estate company. And the entire discovery session somewhere left everybody in a shock and uh, a surprise that they did not come prepared with even knowing what the company's business was. Which is why it is of utmost important before you go into any such meetings, you read about what this client is about. What are the benefits of understanding the client's business? For any of us, one, we gain a lot of client strength, uh, trust. Second, it helps us pre-identify a lot of problems. And when we pre-identify a lot of problems, like if they have a if they don't have a uh, strong social media presence, we know probably if they have ad studio, they would want to leverage it. Uh, Pre-identifying problems also help us to present more value to the customer. Thirdly, showcasing that we have taken ownership of their business problem before even they came to ground with us. 
And fourthly, bringing more ideas to the table without delay, not going to the configuration stage and then thinking, OK, we have the best solution possible. But maybe in the initial stages only, if we've done our research well, we'll be able to lay down a lot of ideas there and then itself. Saves time. Uh, towards the end, and this is almost the end of uh, what I'll be presenting today, I have come out with some of the key questions that all of us should be asking a client. In this, I have taken a random example of an ed tech client. Uh, these sessions could be in the discovery phase, and our questions should actually be uh, more than this, what I'm asking uh, here. But this will give you a glimpse of idea of what kind of questions should we be asking. The answers by the marketer, how will that help us define what the use case is, define what is the objective clearly that we are trying to solve through a journey builder or NAT Studio or any product that Salesforce offers. For example, the first question we ask, what are your advertising goals? And they reply, our advertising goal is just conversion. We are, a, we are launching a paid ed tech course and we want people to register. Then we ask, whom do you want to target through this campaign? They say, we want to target students of class 11th and 12th. We understand it's a B2C uh, uh, journey that they want to capture. We ask them, do you have a database of these targets? They said, yes, but we also want to acquire new leads. Then we ask, for what time and frequency do you want to run this campaign? They said, probably a month, maybe four to five emails. We don't want to spam the user a lot. But because it is a time-bound uh, course, we want that the registration should finish before that time comes. We ask what channels and mediums do you want to leverage? They say we want to definitely do emails, we want to do SMS. And we think the younger generation is present on Facebook, so we also want to leverage social. Then we ask them about the landing pages. If they want to communicate through that, they say yes. We also ask them about their existing landing pages. They, yes. they say yes for registration. We ask them, do you foresee a need for a form in your campaign so that before jumping on the guns, we know, is there a need of a cloud page or not? Uh, and they say, yes, we want to capture new leads, uh, email IDs and phone numbers, maybe interest as well. And then we ask them, do you need any downloadable material that could be attached to the email? And they say, yes. When we uh, advertise about the course, we uh, do attach brochures or syllabus to these emails. Now, after knowing all these answers, and none of these answers, uh, none of these questions were basically intrusive. None of these questions did not solve a problem. And none of these questions were unrelated to the problem we are trying to solve. What this led us to believe was that what is this campaign's core objective that my marketer is trying to achieve, that my client is trying to achieve here. And it is clearly that they want to run a lead conversion or a registration campaign via channels like an email or an SMS or a Facebook ad for both their existing clients also and their new customers also. Now, uh, I would not know what most of you all, how you all go about presenting these use cases to your customers, but this is how we do it. And what we've learned with time is that if you straight away deep dive into a Salesforce software and start open and giving them a, start opening that, uh, uh, the journey builder and trying to show them what a decision split is and how does it look like in the software, it becomes slightly overwhelming for the marketer. For us, we feel that this becomes an easier practice where the marketer is able to relate to what problem are we solving with them. And we do all the groundwork in terms of what the problem is, how we are going to solve, and all the brainstorming on a paper first and then move it to the configuration stage. So, we propose here, after knowing what the question and the answers were, that there are, we understand there are two leads. You can capture these leads from a Facebook ad via Ad Studio. You can use our existing database of students from 11th and 12th class. That becomes a data extension here. Two different data extensions that come into picture. And then finally, uh, we, we suggest that you do four emails, one per week for an entire month for this campaign. There could be, and these three emails, the one that you see in sequence, if you can relate it to the digital funnel, this looks exactly like this. First would be the awareness email. People register, pay, best. This is called a hot lead that gets converted. And then you send a thank you email or a survey or a fee receipt or a roll number, et cetera. And it's end of game. However, people who don't convert, enter the nurture journey. Nurture journey, if you remember the digital funnel again, where the 
the consideration stage or the interest or the desire stage is called nurturing the lead. So you give them a coupon code, you give them a discount or something and you nurture them in a way that you nudge them to make a payment and register for this course. Again, people who do uh, exit the journey after a fee receipt. Thirdly, again, if they do not convert, you do, you continue your nurture process, which is called a lead nurture process. And this could be a very long process in terms of that you end the journey here, but the leads who did not convert through this campaign, you can propose that you wait for a month or two and or if the time allows, you wait, you change your content type, you change your subject lines, and then you do a similar journey on all those leads that did not convert through this journey. But this way is how you speak a marketer's language, and this is how a marketer would easily understand. Your life becomes easier if the client in front of you is primarily tech. In that case, our method of going straight away into Salesforce demos or showing them how journeys look like in Salesforce is a good strategy. However, mostly they are marketers and they do not understand uh, and it overwhelms them to see how that demo looks like. Uh, this brings me to my final slide and I would summarize the best practices or anything that you should be doing and what I presented in the entire deck. One, you should adapt and prepare for client meetings depending on what your core audience looks like. Like I said, if you know that you're facing a marketer, you need to be thorough with the terminologies that I told you. If you're meeting, meeting a tech expert, life would be easier for you. Second, irrespective of your role in the system, whether you're a consultant, a technology person, a project manager, you should participate and spend most time in discovery to create a long list of business challenges that you will solve through your automation. The more complex the Salesforce product, more is the need to showcase these use cases outside of SFMC, SFMC solutions first. When I say outside of SFMC solutions, this is the PPT format or some other software that you want to use that doesn't overwhelm the customer. And when I say complex Salesforce solution, it could be an interaction studio also. And you should have an easier layout of presenting it to the client first before showing them how it is possible in an interaction studio. In case of presence of multiple automation solutions, like in our case, there was Ad Studio and Journey Builder, always try and show interconnectivity of these two products and dependencies on each other. It helps the client understand that they made the right decision by buying these two, three products together and how they're related. Second last, be proactive during these discovery phases to identify the challenges that tech might face during configuration. Pre-identify them so that we don't end up asking the same questions during the configuration phase. Last, stay up to date with the industry best practices. So if the marketer needs guidance in any of his roles, you can propose an educated solution. Uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. And uh, um, most of this is my opinion because I come from the other side of the bucket and now I am Martek. Uh, so I will be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Yep, Divya, thank you so much. And uh, please, please put your questions in the chat. Uh, and Divya, I personally like the industry knowledge section. I can totally chime in for that. You know, I can relate it with one of my past experience where, you know, it was an e-commerce client. So not only I studied their site, but I studied their competitor sites. And once you have the industry knowledge, my like my confidence in those discovery sessions was sky high. So I can totally relate to that. And thank you for emphasizing on that section. Thanks so much. Yep. yep. All right, guys. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, drop them into the chat section. Anybody would like to uh, discuss anything or wants and more clarity on any on the point? Any questions they have? It's great to have a session where, you know, we get to know about the other side of uh, the marketing automations where it is not about the technology, but more related to the domain and how, what customer is thinking and what their, their pain point is, we can understand. Okay. Uh, we are getting some more questions here. So how retargeting works? Is this for the leads we lose in the cracks? Divya? Yeah, I can see the question. Yes. Yep. Uh, hi, Gaurav. So, uh, 
retargeting, as I gave the example, is very evident from mostly uh, when uh, you've nurtured the client enough, or your customer enough, and it reaches a stage where he's about to buy the product or the service, but he ends up not buying it. So anybody who reaches your cart or leaves it in your wish list or comes to the payment page, or even if it's nothing to do with payment, it is just to do with registration or an app download, and it comes to that stage, but doesn't end up completing the process. You have in marketing, this is called remarketing or retargeting, and you retarget these customers through nurture emails, discounts, uh, or even trying to solve the problem that they might be facing. They could be facing a problem on the payment page. It could be a technical error. So the way you try and solve this problem, either through nurturing or solving their problem, understanding why did they not complete the process when they were almost about to complete it is called retargeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Next hmm. question is by Rishi. Okay. So uh, can you explain the advocacy phase a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, Advocacy is, and maybe I'll give you a personal example. So um, uh, I use a lot of products, cleaning products from a company called Better India. And they make chemical free products. And the first time I used it just because I didn't want to use uh, chemical on my floor going forward. I have two pets and they usually lick the floor a lot. So I wanted to go for a chemical free product. And I started buying Better India products. And uh, I liked them so much that I started to speak about that product in front of my friends that you should be using it or how can they use it? How is it better? This is a way advocacy works. This is the message that a brand conveys to you. And somewhere it is an indirect way that you know that if, if this product clicks with the user, they will speak highly about it. That is the advocacy space. And a lot of uh, marketers also do journeys around just advocacy as well. When they ask you to, you know, submit a feedback, that is a form of advocacy. For sure. Yep. Thanks, Divya. Any more questions, guys? Yeah. 